Howdy, everybody. Today we'll be talking about the era of good feeling. This is a period of time just after the War of 1812, where America, as we talked about during the War of 1812, feels like we won the war. And this is going to force the nation together in a new way. So let's look at some of the questions that are facing the nation at the end of the war. Now, we talked about these questions when Washington became president after the creation of the Constitution. So let's see if we can answer some of these questions and see how things have gone so far. First, what would the national government under the Constitution or would the national government under the Constitution be strong enough to deal with the country's problems at home, but not so strong as to take away individual freedom and destroy the states? And yeah, we've seen this be successful. The... Uh, Washington and Hamilton reaction to the whiskey tax, strong reaction, 10,000 man army, but Washington's kind of middle approach where he released most of the prisoners and didn't really do a harsh punishment, sent the message that that type of rebellion was no longer going to be acceptable, but we managed to survive and the states haven't lost too much power. So, so far, so good. Would the U.S. be strong enough to have foreign countries respect our interests and independence? And looks like yes so far. We've made some decent treaties. We survived the War of 1812. We didn't so much win it, but Americans have a different interpretation of that, at least historically. Would the U.S. under the Constitution continue to evolve as a democratic republic, or would we stop and remain an aristocratic republic? And as we'll see in the next lecture and or two, that more and more people are becoming able to vote. We're starting to see many states do away with the property requirements, and this is allowing more and more men to vote. It's still a white male democracy, but you no longer have to have land as often as you once used to. So it is improving, it's getting better, but we're still a long way from a true democratic republic. And finally, would political parties destroy the United States? And no. And as of this moment in history, so as of the end of the War of 1812, there's only one political party left really to speak of. Because of the big uh, convention that they had, that the Federals had during the War of 1812, that really turned a lot of people off on the Federalists, which leads ultimately to the death of that party, only leaving Jefferson's Democratic Republicans as the last standing party. So this means many people in America at the time thought this was our last party. We're good to go. No more problems. When James Monroe takes over as president, this is known as an era of new freedom or an era of new nationalism. And this is where we see kind of the first truly positive nationalism and patriotism in the United States, where people are willing to sacrifice for the greater good. This is why it becomes known as the era of good feeling. After the War of 1812, Americans are feeling good, we're optimistic, and we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of ourselves or our regional interest if that means we can improve the nation as a whole. And what that translates to is some new types of nationalism that will redefine and reshape America. And it's interesting because of who's doing this reshaping and what this is gonna look like. So remember, there's only one political party, the Democratic Republicans, that's Jefferson's party. The party that talked about small government, small business, really emphasized farmers and independent land ownership. So let's look at how this new nation is developing under what we call first, economic nationalism. So we're starting to see a whole new wave of industrialization. We're starting to see more manufacturing and production taken off. And as a result of that, Henry Clay is gonna introduce a new system, a system called the American system. It has three parts, internal improvements, the tariff of 1816, and the second bank of the US. Now remember, this is the party of Jefferson that's doing all this, the party of farming and that agrarian vision. Yet all these policies, all these parts of the American system look strangely like what Alexander Hamilton proposed when he was influencing the president. So let's break each of these down one by one. So internal improvements talks about all kinds of logistical improvements for the nation, usually relating to canals and increasing the speed of transportation. 
and probably the big showpiece internal improvement of the American system was the Erie Canal. Building it all the way from New York or all the way across New York from New York City down to or across to Buffalo, New York, connecting Lake Erie to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is a massive undertaking because remember, they're building this basically man-made river using hand tools, animal pool tools, but they don't have any major, major machinery like we would use today. So it's beginning to get invented, some of these kind of steam engine driven stuff, but for the most part, this was a human powered or animal powered endeavor. And after the eight or 10 years it took to build it, it's going to dramatically drop the cost of shipping and make it a very attractive method to make more money more easily. And you no longer have to rely on shipping everything all the way down the Mississippi. You can use this channel and go directly to New York. So this is a huge boon on American trade. Now this system operated, this Erie Canal system operated on a series of locks. And these locks are interesting. They actually raise water up and down because this isn't a natural flowing river. It is a man-made river, so it's basically just little sections of water that are stagnant. And you have these locks that move water up and down as the river has to go up or down various elevations. Another internal improvement was turnpikes or toll roads. So this is going to be the beginnings of our road system. We won't see a true kind of highway system that we understand it today until the 1950s, 1960s, so post-World War II development. But these turnpikes are going to begin kind of the first major connections, tying chunks of the United States together, usually within a state, but sometimes even crossing state lines. And this is going to be a big component of the American system, which is tying the various states together in different forms and fashions. And then probably the single biggest invention of the era is, of course, the steamship. This allows something that was very difficult to do up this point, which is not only sail downriver, but sail back upriver at a pretty good pace. So this allows a lot more navigation, a lot more movement, and this is really going to change the transportation game, moving most people and crops and supplies and animals all up and down the rivers, in particular the Mississippi being one of the most heavily used rivers for steamboats today. Then we have that industrial revolution. We're starting to shift from water powered production into steam powered production. So instead of having a water wheel attached to a river, now you could use coal to power steam engines to boil the water, causing steam to run all kinds of machinery. And this is going to allow a whole new level of production like never before. Now, the next big step is the tariff, or next big part of the American system is the tariff of 1816, which is a protective tariff. Now, if you remember, Hamilton, under his economic system, had proposed a protective tariff to boost American business. He did not get that passed. They said it was going to hurt American farming too much. But now, in this era of good feeling, people are feeling pretty happy. So, when Henry Clay proposes the tariff of 1816, he's backed by John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, heavy agricultural production company or a, a state that would be injured by a high tariff. Because that means if we put a high tariff on British or French goods, they would put a high tariff on our raw goods that we're trying to sell overseas. But the Southern states say we're willing to take that hit. We're willing to suffer and make less profit if it means the betterment of the nation and the development of our uh, industrial production capabilities. Now keep this in mind, this agreement only lasts as long as everybody feeling good. This is why it's called the air of good feeling. We're willing to sacrifice our personal self-interest if it means bettering the nation in some way. So keep that in mind because in the near future, this air of good feeling is going to start to wane and we'll start to see some of the chafing under these tariffs. The final part of this American system is the second bank of the U.S. Now remember, Jefferson and Madison thought the second or the first bank of the U.S. was unconstitutional. That it was a horrible thing, that Hamilton was abusing the Constitution by creating it, and it was illegal. Yet, just a few years later, after the War of 1812, once Madison let the bank, the first bank die, didn't renew its charter, the second bank 
gets proposed by the very party to let the first one die. It's the Republicans, the Democratic Republicans, that proposed the Second Bank of the U.S. because they had realized during the War of 1812 that not having a bank made waging a war, managing taxation, managing all the intricacies of a growing nation economically much more difficult. So we get the Second Bank of the U.S. with a similar charter and investment system that we had with the first one. And this one will last up until Andrew Jackson. We'll talk about that when Andrew Jackson decides to set his sights on the Second Bank. So this is the American system that is going to define the nation for the next five to ten years. It'll stretch even a little bit further, but that's when we start seeing some division because of this American system. The true heart of the system only survives as long as everyone's getting along. Once you start seeing that dissent forming, the system begins to fall apart in important ways. The next type of nationalism that we'll talk about is judicial nationalism, where we start seeing the Supreme Court, in this case, the Supreme Court led by John Marshall, begin redefining what it means to have a relationship between the federal government and the states, and the states are beginning to accept that the federal government isn't going to be that federal system that we were proposed during the Philadelphia Convention when everybody was equal. Instead, the federal government is going to begin taking a superior role over the states. So let's look at the big case. So the first of these cases is McCulloch versus Maryland. This has to do with where the bank was located. Technically, the second bank of the U.S. was located within the boundaries of the state of Maryland, which made it susceptible to Maryland laws. So Maryland is going to try to tax the federal bank, the second bank of the U.S., because it doesn't like the bank for a variety of reasons. This causes a big conflict. A court case ensues and makes its way up to the Supreme Court. Now, the court case of McCulloch versus Maryland is going to determine several important things as a result of their decision. So Marshall's Supreme Court decides, first and foremost, states cannot tax the federal government because Maryland had tried to tax the bank in order to drive the bank into bankruptcy. They decided states cannot tax the federal government. And this goes back to that second point that we talked about under the earlier court case, which was Marbury versus Madison. So in this one, we see again, Maryland is determined as to not have the power. That means the states cannot interpret the constitution. And that represents the idea that the compact theory is wrong. So Jefferson's interpretation of the compact theory of government is wrong. And this means that nullification and secession are both not valid theories. So keep this in mind, this is the second major court case where they deny the compact theory of government and by default deny nullification and secession. We'll see those ideas pop up later. Finally, they decide the bank was constitutional. And because the bank is in fact constitutional, that means implied powers do exist. So those implied powers, those reading between the lines of the Constitution that Hamilton alluded to, do in fact exist. And this is going to open the door for the federal government to begin doing a lot more things, creating a lot more departments and organizations because of these implied powers. So this is a major court case that's going to redefine how the nation sees itself. And finally, we have diplomatic nationalism. This is where the United States begins acting like we're a large, powerful, influential nation trying to push other nations around despite have, having barely survived the War of 1812. That misinterpretation of the results of the war pushes us to act much more boldly than we probably would have had it not been for the misinterpretation of the war. So the main issue we're talking about is going to be Native Americans invading into Georgia and South Carolina. So these are mainly the Seminole Indians causing conflicts. And we're going to have Andrew Jackson stationed at Fort Scott ordered to stop these invasions, to stop these raids by the Seminole. And this is going to lead into a major conflict. And the heart of the conflict is because Spain is controlled by, or Florida is controlled by Spain. Now, if we take an army and cross into Spanish territory, that could spark a war with Spain. Andrew Jackson, however, doesn't really care. When the Seminole Indians attack, 
Jackson chases them into Florida, finds their village, burns it to the ground, finds out that they have British guns. So then he goes on a hunt looking for these British merchants that sold these guns to these Indians, eventually challenges the Spanish directly, marching into two of their settlements, finding several British merchants and executing them by hanging. So not only has he invaded foreign territory, he has attacked a foreign town and then executed citizens of a third nation. So he's angered simultaneously Spain and Great Britain by these actions, potentially putting us on the footing for war. Now it's gonna be the Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams that has to deal with all of Jackson's actions. Now in general, Adams, and Jackson don't get along, they don't see eye to eye politically, but in this case, Jackson is doing something very useful for John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams is John Adams' son, and he's going to become one of our greatest statesmen. Kind of, he's an expert at statescraft, one of the best uh, secretaries of state we have, or have had in American history. He won't do as well as being, <laughs> at being president, but as secretary of state, he does extremely well. And he's going to use Jackson's actions as kind of a shield for his diplomatic actions. He's going to condemn Jackson's decisions and his actions, saying, oh, we didn't tell him to do it. Oh, we shouldn't have done that. But, you know, secretly behind doors, they're patting Jackson on the back, saying, good job, keep it up. But in reality, in the kind of public-facing thing, he'll slap Jackson on the wrist, say, oh, we didn't tell you to do that. You are being a little rogue doing this on your own. But this allows kind of the best of both worlds. It allows Americans to kind of have this diplomatic nationalism we're acting bolder and braver than ever before using our military for political means but on kind of the international scene we'd look like oh we're condemning jackson's actions and this is actually going to be spun by john quincy adams into a very good treaty this is a treaty with spain in 1819 called the transcontinental treaty or the adams onice treaty so Adams is our diplomat, and Onis is the Spanish diplomat. Now, there's kind of two major parts to this treaty. The first part is along the kind of Texas-Louisiana border, that line you see running up where we see the modern border, northern border of Texas, all the way up across Spanish territory, what would be Mexico, Mexican territory for about 10 or 20 years. We make a deal with Spain saying, we promise never to cross that transcontinental line, basically running from Louisiana all the way to California. Never in a million years will America cross that line. Because Spain was getting worried as we expanded westward that they might move into, the United States might move into Mexican or Spanish territory. Now in exchange for this promise, Spain just gives the United States Florida. They hand it over. Florida wasn't terribly important to Spain. They had a few outposts, a few forts, but for the most part, it was controlled by the Seminole Indians. And this is going to lead to a series of wars with the Seminoles between the Seminole Indians and the United States government. So Spain kind of just unloads a problematic region onto the United States and we have to deal with it. And we will over time in some very disheartening wars with the Native Americans. But this is an important trade. Now keep in mind, this is 1819. We promise Spain will never cross into this territory. We'll see how long that promise actually lasts. Now one of the last things that Monroe does, he's gonna issue a statement called the Monroe Doctrine. Now this is a very bold statement. So he announces to all of Europe that any nation in the Americas that gains its independence, just like the United States had, is cut off from being recolonized by European nations. And if a European nation tries to recolonize it, America will intervene. So we're saying off limits, we're not going to let anyone recolonize countries in America once they gain their independence. Now, what's crazy about this is we're stating this but we don't have the military or Navy to back it up. But this kind of delusion that we're a great powerful nation begins kind of pushing us to make statements like this. And while we're not able to enforce it, 
what's going to happen is we will have stated this that said we will back this up if you push us on it and then europe doesn't really push us on it for the next 50 60 70 years and by the time they actually push us and we push back we have become a major world power so by the time we get to the late 1800s kind of the 1880s 1890s we begin using the monroe doctrine as a tool to intervene in foreign affairs and we kind of had this tradition of it because we told them this in the early 1800s they just hadn't ever utilized it until the late 1800s but it's been there the whole time and we say well we warned you but we won't see it really coming into effect until post-Civil War era. Now, the end of the era of good feeling begins with the economic collapse and the panic of 1819. And this is when we start seeing major Southern opposition to that tariff that we had from the American system. So with the Panic of 1819, we saw a collapse in agriculture prices and manufacturing prices. It's just the various ups and downs often resulting in the few years following a war. Usually once there's a war in the United States, five to 10 years afterwards, we usually see some sort of economic issue. Not every time, but usually we see such things occurring. And this is roughly what's beginning to happen. Plus all the influx of money from the government for all the aspects of the American system caused a lot of issues. And we're starting to see the beginning of the southern states kind of balking at paying this high tariff and their tax their goods being taxed and tariffed in europe they're wanting a reduction of this tariff so we're starting to see this division and rejection of the american system and that's going to play in heavily to the next presidential election in the next four years now the final thing we need to talk about is going to be the missouri compromise passed in 1820 now, the effort of Missouri Compromise was to once and for all deal with the issue of the expansion of slavery. How would it work? What would we do with it? What are kind of the components of stopping this fight over slavery? So let's look at the various parts. So first, Missouri comes in as a slave state. Missouri, the southern half of Missouri was heavily utilized by slave owners. So they allow Missouri to come in as a slave state. In exchange, Maine comes in as a free state. So Maine had belonged to Massachusetts for a long time since the colonial era. Now they broke off Maine and made it a free state to maintain that balance between slave and free states in Congress. Then they decide on the 36-30 line. So 36 degrees, 30 minutes. This is what's also known as the Mason-Dixon line. This is the line that divides slave and free states. Now, in the states that already existed before the line was drawn, slavery can exist north of it. But in all the territories, slavery can no longer exist above this line. So this means all that unorganized territory from the Louisiana Purchase is now free territory. This is the second time Congress has regulated slavery in U.S. territory. We did it first with the Northwest Ordinance. This is the second time. Now keep this in mind, because as we get closer to the Civil War, the Southern states are going to begin arguing that Congress does not have the right to regulate slavery in the territories. Yet this is the second time we've done it, and the second time North and South have agreed to such a decision. Now that opposition to the tariff, like we said a minute ago, is growing. The Southern states looks like they're being burdened unfairly, and it looks like the Union particularly the northern states are growing fat off this tariff while the southern states are being beat down and bedraggled. And this is going to be the situation in which Andrew Jackson is going to step as a champion for the southern states, as a champion for the common men, opposing things like the federal bank and these tariffs and many aspects of the American system. But we'll stop there for today. We'll pick up with the next lecture about Andrew Jackson and the Jacksonian era. See you all soon.